Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 17th, 2022. This is the week in charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Looks like more and more people are finding the show. I'll put a link down below in case you're watching this on YouTube. Usually the day of the show, you can find a banner ad on my website, or you can always go to daylander.com slash webinar. Register even if the show link is old, uh, or the date is old, I should say, because sometimes I forget to put the new date in. And by the way, probably no webinar next week, February 24th. It's, it's hard for me sometimes to keep up with a short market week with everything going on because it's a President's Day holiday. So what are we talking about? Obviously, current market conditions have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks, although I don't imagine you'll have too many crypto picks unless they're shorts. When you put in a crypto symbol, if you don't mind, just put in a dollar sign in front of it so I'll know it's crypto and not a stock. And also, uh, let's wait until we get to the live charts for that, if you don't mind. All right, what are we talking about? What do we focus on, I should say? Well, riding the storm out, following your methodology. And I started talking about this a little bit in my stock charts show, Trading Simplified. I want to follow up on it this week in a little more detail. This is Flame Screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then, barring a line from Greg Morris. So let's talk about riding out a market turn. And I don't know if riding out is the right word to use, but we'll go with that for now. So what I did here was, obviously it's the S&P 500 from, I guess, midday yesterday, along with three stocks I have underlaid, and APG and ARLP, these were two stocks that we were already long coming into the market slide. So obviously market peaked right here, okay? And this is APG in the orange, and this is ARLP in the blue. Let's take a look at what happened. So we had $7,030 in open profits and APG, and obviously we didn't know the market was going to tank, okay? But it did. And then at the time of the snapshot, our profits dropped to 48.25. So if we subtract 48.25 from 70.30, that gets us 22.50. So that's what we lost by holding on to that position. And by the way, the stop is is fairly close. It's it's about to get stopped out down here. But maybe like before, we might be able to ride out a little bit of a correction in that one. Now, we get stopped out, we get stopped out. We're not throwing caution to the wind. Now, let's take a look at ARLP. And I was hoping this would make for a fantastic example. It's still a pretty good example because let's just see what happens. But ARLP at the peak, this is a blue line, we had $8,770 in open profits. By the way, this comes from the open portfolio. And I went back to the date the market peaked. And if you want to look at those, go to davelander.com slash archives, and I'll leave a link below for that too. And what's interesting is as the market began to tank, this position actually went up in value. It was worth $97.80. So about a thousand dollar increase. And if you go all the way to over here, even as the market's bottoming, it's skirting right around brand new highs. But at the time of the snapshot, it was worth 8640. So you can see if you take 8640 from 8770, that's a loss of 130 on that. So not too impressive by holding on to those existing positions, although I have to say. I felt pretty good about the ARLP before it's pulled back a little bit, obviously, because it was obviously still going up in value. And the point I'm trying to make here is you want to ride out your positions down to the stops and not just pull the plug on everything. Now, micromanaging, busting your plan often works, and it works enough to suck you into doing it, right? Well, the beauty of the trading service is I lay out my plan and then I have to follow it. Sometimes I don't want to follow it, but I have to follow it because I lay out a plan for you. And I try to follow it as close as possible. I don't, I'm not always perfect with it. But in this case, I can guarantee you I'm still long these two particular stocks. Now, the other thing, what you do, especially on the long side, 
when you see the market tanking like this, okay, you need to get super, super selective. It better be one charming stock to go after. It ideally, you want it to be in a sector that's defying gravity. And I found this KLXE, I liked it. It's an energy stock. And we got in it right around here and it bounced around quite a bit. But at the time of the snapshot, the closed profits of $1,000. Remember, we're looking for 1% on the entire portfolio. And by the way, these numbers are based on 100K. So if your account's bigger than 100K, then these numbers would be bigger. If your account's smaller than 100K, then these numbers would be smaller if you were following the service itself. But anyway, I wanted to show you how it adds up. And again, we were very selective on the long side. And knock on wood, we did find this energy stock and it turned out okay so far. Knock on wood, okay? Come in. So after all was said and done, based on this snapshot, it's a $152 loss. But we followed a plan and we became very selective on the long side. And this is how it shook out. Plus, we're still long three stocks that have hit the profit target. So we're free rolling so to speak on those. So I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully this one doesn't stop out and hopefully this one keeps on keeping on, although it did pull back from here and it bounced a little bit today. So these numbers are a little low, but we'll see what happens and we'll see if we could ride out a longer term trend in those. And again, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully, all three to three of these go on to make new equity highs, especially the two that we decided to follow the plan on and are still holding on to. What about the short side? I was worried you might ask me that. Well, short side didn't work out so well. We did initially make a thousand dollars or one percent on tandem and scratched out on the remainder for about a one percent gain overall. ADI came dangerously close to the initial profit target, but in the trading service, I follow it mechanically in a spreadsheet, okay? So technically, yes, this one stopped out for an $800 loss. This could have been a $2,000 loss if, if it had stopped out for a full loss, but we did trail that stop lower and unfortunately didn't quite get to the initial profit target. I'm gonna show you that in just one second. And I'm gonna show you what happened to the put position that I talked about in the Facebook group, Dave Landry's Trend Traders, on that one. And then the LACC, another one where we trailed the stop lower, but unfortunately stopped this out. And so all this shorting we did, okay, we ended up losing 1393 on the short side. It happened, spelled with a silent SH. And I'm going to show you what happened, obviously, in a minute in the S&P 500, just in case you hadn't been following along at home, which I know you have, and, and why we got jerked around so much on the short side. Short side's tough. Make no bones about it. Now, opportunities are few and far between, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't keep looking. And I noticed some of you guys have been still active with the IPOs. And, and sometimes, and I need to remind myself this lesson, too. Sometimes IPOs, at least a few of them, can still do pretty good in spite of the overall market. And I think what happens there is, or the reasoning there, is that as a general statement, people might be negative on the overall market, but they might be willing to throw a little speculative money around on some sort of SPOC or, like I'll show you in one second, or some sort of IPO. So that doesn't mean that you don't keep looking. You got to continue to do your homework no matter what. You might find a setup that just looks fantastic, even though the market's not doing so hot. Ideally, though, you want to be super, super duper selective. And as I'll say in one minute, less is more. You want to err on the side of not taking trades versus taking too many, obviously. So BRCC, this kind of brings up an interesting discussion. The DSPOC day was February 10th. Now, I've never heard that term before, DSPOC, until today. I was looking up Black Rifle Coffee, and I saw an interview with the, with the CEO. And if you look at this one on telechart, it's going to show the first day of trading is 
February 10th, if you look at it on stockcharts.com, it's going to show a much longer history. Well, I don't have a definitive answer for you, but the way I kind of see it is on DSPOC day, it, it becomes an IPO. And I'm open for discussion on that. But it seems like after the DSPOC day, a lot of these SPOCs begin to act like an IPO. Now, a client called me earlier, actually texted me about this stock, wanted to know what I thought. And I, I, I saw one of you guys brought it up a few days ago in Facebook, which I want to thank you for doing that. So let's take a look at the buy at B. So day one was here. And if that high does not get exceeded, then or day five or later to trigger a buy signal, it has to not only close at a new closing high, but it also has to close above that day one high if the day one high sets the high for the week. What does that mean? Well, day two, as you can see right here, is higher than day one. So that day one rule is no longer in effect. And so far, as of day two, that's the highest close. Day three, day four, day five. Now, I ended up buying it here. I was looking at those funny looking charts that, that are like colored in. They're kind of blocky looking. I don't know what they call those things, but they got like a, a they're red or green and they're kind of thick. And anyway, and I, was not looking at where the close really was. And for some reason, I didn't realize that the close is actually here. And I thought that it triggered yesterday and I missed it. So I figured I could get in on a rally today. And I was very grateful that the client texted me. I might have got a little too excited thinking that it already triggered. Technically, it would not be a buy until today's close. At, at uh, it closed a little bit lower than this. My screen's got a screensaver on it, so I don't know exactly where it closed, but 18 and change or whatever. I've got it mark to mark in, in a slide or two. But anyway, I thought it was already a buy. Should I thought I should already should have been long this thing. So I got in an intraday rally at 1688, and I flipped it out two points higher. And it's funny, when I put in my limit order, I'm like, am I being greedy? And as soon as I feel that gosh darn limit order, it shot up about five points. And that's a bit of a bummer. But hey, you know what? I'm not going to complain. So I did this across multiple accounts. But I grabbed this snapshot here because it's a nice even thousand shares for you to see. And I banked with the two-point profit, 11.94. And then on the remainder, it's 496. Now, I did make a few mistakes in here, right? Number one, I sort of front ran that signal without even knowing it. And by the way, I'm kind of backing into something here. If you do have a buy at B and you have the mother of all rallies and you happen to notice it, it's okay to maybe front run that setup a little bit maybe treat it as a day trade. And if everything sets up right, then you take a part, part of it home like this, okay? So that was a decent little trade. And on the 496, this is my hope. Hopefully I'm with this for a long, long time. And if I stop out, I stop out, at least I bank some money. Now, it's confession time tonight. And, and you know me, I try to show you as much as I can worse at all and i do want to show you that i actually made a mistake and I actually sold an extra 100 shares by accident for some reason i punched in 600 instead of 500 so we'll see if that goes one way or the other in my favor or against me it doesn't really matter but not a huge mistake okay but i do want to show you that i do make errors and i do make mistakes probably more than i should given you know how long i've been at this but everyone I know makes mistakes, okay? And sometimes you make them in your favor and sometimes you don't. Now, here's another IPO. And again, just because the market gets a little iffy doesn't mean you need to stop doing your analysis. 
day one. Okay, so that's the high we need to watch. Obviously, day two, it took out that high. So that rule is no longer in effect. Day three, that's the highest close so far. Day four, any close above that day four close, which sets a high for the week so far, would be a buy. So today on the close, I bought the stock, okay? I didn't bet the farm given the market conditions, but I went ahead and I bought in on the buy at B. Buy at B, you buy the highest close of the first week. If that's set on day five, then you buy it on day five. If it's set on day four and this thing goes down in basis for three months, okay, this is where I forget about them. And by the way, if this thing didn't exceed this close on the close, like it did today, and goes down in basis, stick an alarm on your chart feed and forget about it, okay? And a month from now, two months from now, you might get a little zing to wake you up like, hey, I might need to buy this stock. So we'll see how this one shakes out. So the post of the week, I'm gonna give it to Stuart for bringing up Sky X. What would the world be without hypothetical questions? But it's possible that I might have missed it had I not been watching my Facebook group and saw this post. And I wanna thank you guys for bringing things up like this. So John says, my SkyX chart looks totally different. First day high of 14, yes. And that's the tricky aggravating part about IPOs is sometimes they do look a little different. As far as I can tell, that 14 is not a legitimate tick. Now, if somebody can show me different, let me know. Now, on stock charts, you'll see a tick right here. And what stock charts does, and sometimes I wish I could turn it off, it shows you the like pre-market IPO price. This is an actual trading. This is like pre-market price, which I guess is a little scary because it didn't rally above that on the first day of trade. But that's a, I guess that's something else to maybe think about. All right, any questions on buy at B or Sky X or anything we've talked about so far? Well, that stinks as this one is on my AAA list. Well, let's see how it shakes out. Now, I've done a little research and buy at B plus one could be a great pattern. Sometimes you'll get that buy signal and let's take a look at it real quick okay sometimes in, in buy at b by the way takes a leap of faith okay so you jump in at 14 bucks round numbers and you don't know what's going to happen right okay it's not like you're getting in earlier in the day like brcc where at least it's really moving in your favor when you're getting in and you might be catching some of that euphoria. You might be catching a nice move higher. So it does take a leap of faith. But yeah, sometimes you'll come in and immediately get beat up in these things. And let's say tomorrow it opens at 13. Well, watch 13.89. And if it closes above 13.89, then think about it. Okay. Yeah, so other feeds are showing. Yeah, it, it depends on what feed you look at and where what it's showing the uh, first day of uh, trading uh probably should have gone back i mean as far as i could tell that that opening tick was not legit but first day of trading is is on the 11th so go back to the 11th maybe on those days take a look at an intraday chart and and see if there's actually any real trading up there and that's a tricky thing about ipos and so i have this pattern i like to follow called buy a b but it's it's a little even though it's the most simplest pattern in the world it can be a little bit tricky when one feed says this and one feed says that, and it's a spock that's been despocked. And so sometimes you just kind of have to, again, take a leap of faith and, and go with it if it's kind of in the spirit of the setup. So thanks again, Stuart, for bringing up SKYX. Anyone sky watching today? 
All right. Last week in the Facebook group, kind of sounds like last week at Bandcamp, right? Stock chart shows the first day on 210. Yeah, I think that was the first day, correct? And then the day before, should have saw the high tech. So I had this stock set up as a short at 160, protective stop 170, that's 10 points, obviously, and IPT 10 points below the entry of 150, entry of 164, in case somebody's listening to this and not watching. Entry 160, IPT of 150, 10 points below the entry. So it was in a downtrend and it pulled back and it's a downtrend from all time highs, bow tie probably and some other stuff, okay? And it began to sell off a little bit. It triggered an entry here. Our stop goes up here, and our initial profit target is down here. Now, this sucks, to put it mildly. And this is the short side, you know, pain in the ass, right? Of course, it triggers and turns right back up. What's the old adage? All shorts go against you. Didn't quite stop out, though. Rolled right back over, came really close at IPT, or close enough for government work, right? on a short especially, and then turn around went right back up and then eventually stops us out. I was talking about options as a substitution for stock, and I'll show you my Facebook post here in just one second. What you do, as I've said before, is you start at the money and you start working back. Now, I only went one week out, and I've got a long post in a minute I'll show you, but my thinking was, especially on the short side, if it's going to go, it should go pretty quickly, right? So I only went one week out, and the options cost me 10 bucks each. Well, that's $2,000. Bought a couple options, this one account. Can't short this one account, so I bought a couple options. And that's plenty. That's just two, but it's plenty. That's $2,000 at risk. Now, it's a lot better than putting up $32,000 in margin, and that's the advantage of options. And it's almost like one way you could look at it is taking your loss up front. And if the option completely evaporates, and I know I'm, I'm teaching bad money management here, but, but if the option completely evaporates and you still have some time left, then let it go and see what happens. So this is where I ended up selling this and made 897 on that option position. So here was my post that I put up. I'm always asked about options and the answer is always tricky, and it is. So let me give you an example. To mimic the service, I bought 170 ADI puts next Friday expiration, which was last Friday, at 10, which at the time was at about 925 in the money. That's intrinsic. So that option at expiration, if everything's constant, if it's still the same price, will be worth $9.25 the second it expires. Okay. So there was only 75%, 75 percent, 75 percent, 75 cent premium or extrinsic value in the option. So if the price stays the same for the week, it costs me 75 cents to have that option. Well, obviously a lot of the stuff happened between now and then, right? So I put up 1K per 100 shares versus 60,000 per 100 shares. Is one week enough? I don't know. It almost wasn't. If the slide returns between now and then, yeah, since they slide faster, they glide. If not, I'm about 75% plus any loss of intrinsic if I have if I keep having to reset, then they beat me. I'll explain that in one second. Also require more and more decisions. It does. On the flip side, I'll be able to sleep at night until next Friday. So you're short a couple hundred shares. This thing goes flying 20, 30 points higher overnight. It could happen you wake up and you're hurt and pop. In fact, you might be staying awake at night wondering if that's gonna happen. Whereas, okay, I've got $2,000 in this thing. You know, I'm not gonna be happy. I'm gonna drop an F-bomb. Where's my F-bomb? This one's gonna let's go. <laughs> I'll drop an F-bomb or two, okay? But I'm gonna live the fight another day. The old hedge fund adage. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So the entry was here, and this is where I bought the option, somewhere around here. And luckily, I was able to get out of the option on Friday on expiration day. The market tanked, 
usually if I have a lot of put up, put up, <laughs> if I have a lot of put options, the market goes straight up that are expiring on Friday and then Monday it tanks. And then I'm really dropping F-bombs for real. Well, you can look at this and I can make you do argument. Well, it worked, didn't look, didn't it? Look at me. Well, I had staying power to stay with the position, but it, it did at one point evaporate to about 70 to 80% of what I put up in the position. Now, with staying power, when it was up pushing towards 170, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to hang loose, full of juice, and stick with this position, even though that options pretty much evaporated, okay? And then 170 was a stop anyway. Oh, I think I know what happened. The um, we we trailed the stop lower and then it stopped out, so it didn't hit 170. So that's what happened on that one. All right. But anyway, right there, right before two days before expiration, that option was only worth probably a couple of bucks, if that much. And then luckily, again, I was able to make a really nice profit on the position. Now the seller saved my butt. It could have expired worthless, and I'd have no position. And the potential exists to have to rinse and repeat. So you could end up with multiple losses. If you short this thing and it doesn't quite stop you out, you don't have to bank that loss, right? You just hang on and then hopefully, eventually it'll tank and you'll get your IPT and your trail stop lower. So had that big sell off not occurred and that option expired, I would have been a hurt and pop. So the point I'm trying to make is it's tricky it can work out beautifully if you want to be positioned and you want that position that's great maybe i went a little too short dated but i don't like paying a lot of fluff for my options now as i alluded to a second ago you can sleep at night but what happens if you have to take losses and reset so you could end up losing let's say you want to risk two percent of that position you can end up losing more than 2% if you keep having to reset these options trying to catch a trend. Now, with options, you got to get direction right, and that's hard enough to get direction right. And then you have to get timing right, okay? So had that stock sold off on Monday instead of Friday, I would have lost a lot of premium on that option, on that expiring option. And in some cases, with options, you have to get volatility right. So options trading can be really tricky. As I said before, I was a consultant for a hedge fund that traded options exclusively for about 10 years. And they would ask for my predictions. And I was just kind of a trend-following moron. I was like, well, the market's going up. Okay. How high is it going to go? I don't know. It just looks like it's going up. At the rate it's going up now, I don't know. Maybe it'll be four points higher a week from now. Look at bonds. Take it the time. And it's like, okay, it, it, you know, just so many questions and want to know how long that's going to take. Is that one day or two days or three days? Or Because as you just saw with that position, one or two days or one day can make all the difference in the world. So with options, you have to get directions right, direction right, okay, and timing. It has to do what you think it's going to do within that set amount of time. And in some cases, you have to get volatility right. Now, if you're a little bit more advanced in your qualified account, such as an IRA, options might be your only choice. Now, as I said a minute ago, your margin savings could be substantial. What's 2,000, what's two divided by 30? 2,000, let's just say divided by 32,000, 6%. So you're putting up, is that right? You're putting up 6% of the margin versus 32, versus 100% of the margin. And those those numbers don't seem exactly right, so don't quote me on that. But $2,000 versus $32,000. But if you're losing $2,000 a week on options as a substitution for stock, eventually that's going to start to add up. And that's why option sellers, for the most part, do pretty damn good. For the most part is the key phrase in that sentence. Every now and then they blow up. And every now and then you will blow up if you become an option seller. 
Now, shorting is a pain in the buttocks. When the world comes unglued, yeah, but it often, but often lots of fits and starts. What am I trying to say there? With really, really bad English. I was reading a slide before we went live, like, what am I saying? Basically, shorts are a real pain, and, and the old adage, adage, all shorts go against you, seems to ring true. Because a lot of times it's like it takes off, you're feeling great, it goes straight back up, knocks you out, and then of course it implodes. And sometimes puts can help you ride that out, but other times you run out of time, and what I've been preaching, you have to start over. Now, you can do some things like rolling down when blessed with a windfall, but that does add some complexity. Now, I did for S and G's at a separate account, just buy one option on ADI as it was expiring, about an hour left in the day or an hour and a half left in the day. And here's my thinking, I'm 14 points in the money or so on these long put options. They're so deep in the money and they're expiring in a couple hours or less, if that stock begins to rally, all of that money is going to evaporate, okay? The chances of that stock rallying or bouncing significantly, two, three, four points, are fairly significant. And if it scares the bejesus out the shorts and they all come rushing in, the damn thing can go up 10 points, my option's worthless, okay? And then, of course, roll over on Monday. <laughs> so what you can do in a situation like that is, okay, well, I've got all this money in the money, okay? About, uh, let's see, was it like $3,000 worth of options that could just evaporate like that? And I know it's going to bounce a little bit against me. So if I could get a cheap put option that's almost ready to expire. So I rolled, I just rolled down one. I had so much going on. I didn't have time to roll down more options last Friday. So just for S and G's, I bought one at 50 cents, okay? because that position could easily go against me 50 cents, could easily go against me two or three points, right? Let's say three points is 600 bucks or whatever, evaporating, it could, or it could be $3,000 evaporating, it could be a lot, quick. So I bought one at 50 bucks and then I flipped it out at, or bought it at 50 cents and flipped it out at $1.40. Kind of an S&G type of trade, but it also kind of kept me short, so to speak, all the way into the close. And I exited, as you can see, about 15 minutes before the close, 14 minutes before the close. All right, a couple of random thoughts. As I said last week, would you see bonds go down, stocks go down, gold go down, and then hopefully not the dollar too, but if you see a lot of assets all evaporating at the same time, we could be in a liquidation market. So do pay attention, especially gold and bonds and stocks. When those three go down, that's always a little scary. But maybe keep an eye on the dollar and Bitcoin too. It's been choppy AF. I mean, I tell you, if you're frustrated right now, it's not just you, okay? It's been it's been bumpy AF, okay? It's been impossible to hold on to shorts because the, the S&P is just jerking around. There's not a whole lot of long opportunities, although I know I make it look like there's some great opportunities, but that was just one today, okay? And then that KLXE, that was not an easy trade. That thing was all over the place. Every now and then it's kind of thin, you know, you're looking to get out and it's got a big stupid spread. So I don't want to make it look easier than it is tonight, but in a lot of cases, a lot of things that I said, just follow along. I know, easier said than done is all you have to do. Now, we've been talking a lot about psychology in the group. And I reread, the, 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 probably a lot of that started because I reread The Discipline Trader. I'm listening to Trading in the Zone. And one of you guys brought up some Douglas videos and I watched those on YouTube and they were pretty good. But one thing it got me thinking about, and that's what I thought I would talk about this week until the market gave us all these wonderful examples and all this other stuff I needed to cover. And maybe I can flesh this out in future presentations. But psychology 24-7 is great. Don't get me wrong. And I love it. And I eat it up in a little neurology too. But eventually you still need super confidence in your methodology. And you still need the experience of experiencing a lot of markets. 
And one thing I was thinking about is everybody says, don't grail hunt, don't grail hunt, don't grail hunt. And, and I say the same thing too, but if it wasn't for grail hunting, hunting, I wouldn't have learned what, how much, as much as I have about the markets, okay? So I wouldn't completely discourage you from grail hunting. That's where I'm going on this because you do need to get a lot of experience in the markets and you can get a lot of experience by watching markets, by looking at charts, by hand testing simple stuff, okay? I don't do any computerized programming anymore. I just, I like to hand test things. And I used to, I used to just program, program, program. And now I just look at the charts. But grail hunting is okay, as long as you realize there's no holy grail, right? Because how can they be a holy grail when you're dealing with the emotions of a lot of people, okay? And that's what makes the markets, like we talked about last week and, and probably many weeks prior. You have no idea what they're going to do. I don't know, you know, one of you guys is having a beer and a burrito tonight, you know? And I'm like, man, the beer sounds good. It's like, oh, do I want to drink a beer or not? You know, maybe I could save my carbs for the weekend, you know? So I don't even know exactly what I'm doing tonight. How could I expect to know what everybody in the market's going to do? Now, reoccurring patterns do occur. They're not holy grails, as long as they're conceptually correct. So there's demand. Like today, it's like, okay, well, I have a reoccurring pattern that I've seen in the IPOs that I like. And boy, it sure looks like there's a whole bunch of demand coming into the stock. It kind of dovetails into my setup. And I thought it had triggered the day before, but even if it didn't trigger, I'm also thinking, you know what? Looks like it's things really going. I'm going to go ahead and get in. It seems to be defying gravity and going against the market. So those are things that you could observe over time. But whatever you do, of course, just make sure it's conceptually correct. And last week, I talked a lot about understanding the emotions of the markets and how markets really work. And I think the trend knockout is a beautiful setup that really explains that. So go in and watch last week's presentation. And then maybe go all the way back to maybe the Trading Simplified show I did before. If you're if you're a gold member, go in and watch the all the TKO lessons in, in the methodology course so you can get a feel for the actual pattern itself. Last week, I just talked about the psychology of the pattern mostly. Now, you'll never eliminate losses. And that's one thing Doug was talking about is, is you have a loss on a trade. You go back on that grail hunt. And I'm not sure exactly how to said it, but that's kind of the gist of it thinking there's something you could have done to prevent that loss. And sometimes a good setup can end badly. Sometimes a bad setup can end well. <laughs> but you'll never eliminate all the losses, but you can mitigate quite a few of them through learning how markets really work and learning how, how you work and how some of your decisions might be a little fickle. And, and like if I'm watching an intraday chart and I'm hungry, like I said last week, I go in and eat lunch or whatever, come back in feeling good. All of a sudden, everything looks like a buy, okay? Well, everything might not be a buy. That's my psychology and neurology, and I'm feeling better. And got to be careful to not let your mood affect your trading. You know, good luck with that. Now, a mediocre, simple setup will far outperform a complex one. Occam's razor, make everything or or... Aqua's Razor, I forget exactly how it goes, but basically it says, make stuff simple. <laughs> and there's one that says, make things, I think Einstein is someone that says, makes, make it as simple as possible, but no further. And there's plenty of quotes when it comes to keeping things simple. But I can tell you this, a mediocre, simple methodology will far outperform a complex one. I was playing with stupid little EMA moving average crosses. Uh, earlier tonight, right before, I know you probably want to party with me, <laughs> right before we went live. I think Charlie Kirk or someone talked uh, about once, it was. It, it definitely was in the Kirk report. I don't remember the exact numbers. And I have it on one old chart. It might be seven and 13 or something. But uh, I, I played around those stupid little moving averages quite a bit. And, and they're kind of interesting. And I'll show you that in just one second. And that would be a pretty simple kind of trend methodology to use. Or even simpler, just use one moving average in Landry Light, like I talk about, right? And the reason I say a mediocre, simple methodology will, will far outperform a complex one is a complex one's gonna be harder to follow. There might it might be open for debate, discussion, whatever. 
And a complex one that, that has shown to work really, really well has curve fit itself to, to the markets. And I've done a lot of system development. I've helped others develop systems. And sometimes, disingenuous or not, I was like, well, you know, if you add this moving average, it's going to knock out some of those really, really big losses that really make this system suck and this performance is going to go through the roof. Well, did I inadvertently grail, or not grail hunt, but a curve fit to make it look like a holy grail? I don't know, but a complex system with a lot of rules. I mean, look at the rules in the TFM 10% system. Look at the rules in the buy at B. How, I can't get any more simpler than that, right? All right. If you're, everybody here, I think is in Facebook. If you're not, we'd love to have you. As I say, probably every week, my wife once said, that's the best thing I've ever done with the Facebook group. I agree. It makes you feel normal. We're all kind of Abby normal because we have chosen to trade, right? Every now and then I'll throw out a position or a setup, or whatever, talk about options or whatever, like we did last week. And then you guys are kind enough to throw out a setup here and there. If you like something, throw it out in the group. Let's let's pick it apart a little bit. If you don't mind me playing devil's advocate. But anyway, you have to be a gold member of DaveLander.com. You can go to DaveLander.com slash members or DaveLander.com slash become dash a dash better dash trader. I think that's it. I'll put the link in post. All right, cryptocurrencies. This is an old slide in here, but it seems like everything is relevant. And I'm not going to bore you by going through all of these too late, huh? <laughs> but if you want to screenshot that, I'll, I'll touch upon a couple of these things. So let me jump into crypto. Let's go to live charts. And let me get this switched over. Any, if you guys want to pull up any, I'm going to look at like Bitcoin and a couple of the ones in here. Everything in orange, I'm short. And it's it's been a bumpy ride, you know. I was thinking, okay, all this all these shit coins, S H Y T coins, are going to zero. Looks like, uh, you know, last November I was a super bull in these things. Now I'm a little bit of bear, a little bit. <laughs> my Italian just came out, <laughs> declined early. He's Italian. He talks about like this. <laughs> it's more like, how you doing, my uh, my ringtone for him when he texts me is, how you doing. When it first changes to that. <laughs> for about a week i'd look around and think somebody was talking to me yeah, god god's an italian <laughs> italiano dio el italiano is it dio what's god dio anyway before i digress too far i know too late i'm short these and it's been a bit of a bumpy ride and i think i'm slightly profitable nothing to brag about for sure and these look like they could be in a little bit trouble longer term, as you see. Solana, I was a bull on Solana. I'm kind of drinking the Kool-Aid on that. But the trader in me, when it started going down, had to get out, okay? And then Dow, I'm short this one too. It's kind of hovering near new lows. Ideally, I want to try to, to hold on as long as possible. Do a little little trend following here and maybe survive some kisses of the 30 EMA. That's kind of my goal in those. This is one that I'm long. I was long this one forever. I got to shake it out when, especially with crypto, all went down. But I just got back in recently on that one, or should be in. I don't know. I haven't checked my fills. But even though it's pretty high, I just threw, threw caution to the wind and, and bought a new highs. I wouldn't necessarily recommend you do that. Boy, they're pumping the stuffing out of Sheeb, huh? Yeah, who is going crazy on Sheeb? And I don't know, it doesn't look so hot to me. If you were trading the 230 EMA, your buy would be above this high. And then now that it's kissed the moving average, that would negate that signal. Let's take a look at Bitcoin. And like I said in that slide, Bitcoin and Ethereum can kind of be your gauge. I was a Super Bowl on Ethereum. And some things have come to light in more recent times. I don't know if they're true or not, but maybe some of the things they talked about, I don't know if you called the white paper or not, weren't exactly true. And not enough time to get into that, but there's a lot more people holding bigger hunks of Bitcoin, of, of Ethereum 
than they let on, and it would also benefit them to go to proof of stake versus proof of work. And guess what? They're going to proof of stake. Interesting. So I don't know whether that's true or not, but you guys might want to dig into that just for S and Gs. But all I know is Ethereum's not looking so hot. Okay, it tried to get going above its 30, and now it's kind of rolling back over. If you look at a longer term moving averages, it's got to came up and kiss some longer term moving averages, and now rolling back over. And again, Bitcoin tried to get going and came right back in. Everybody in that parlor is watching this these old lows, okay? And I've even seen some idiots out there doing all kind of pontification based on these lows and how long it took them to get to the lows. And they might look like a genius if they're if it works out, but I, I'd be really careful. So anything, let's say below 30k round numbers, I would get pretty nervous on Bitcoin. Now, the trader in me is not gonna buy a lot of Bitcoin, okay? But I'm bullish on Bitcoin longer term. You know, watch little Michael Saylor. He'll, he'll get you all pumped up and then you buy it and it goes down. You're like, wait a minute, <laughs> why did I do that? So anyway, there's not a whole lot to get excited about in crypto right now. If you guys want to look any look at any of them, let me know. As I often say, 30 EMA can be your best friend here. Don't buy anything if it's below 30 EMA. You're welcome, okay? And as you go through these, look at how many are below the 30 EMA. All right, let's shift gears and get to the market. If you guys don't want, to, if there's nothing you want to cover in crypto. So this is what I was talking about earlier. And by accident, actually, while I was recording tonight's trading service, I, I saw this by accident. And I've got a seven and 13. I don't know the exact numbers, but play around with them if you get bored. And it just so happens to be on bonds. And you can see bonds crossed over seven below the 13 EMA, way back at 150. And this whole slide so far has been contained by that crossover. Of course, it's not always that easy. Although the S&P did cross over and did have a, have a pretty serious slide. We recently crossed right back to the upside and then came right back in. Now, let me just show you something real quick in the P's, and then we'll look at them. I need to get a mouse with a wheel on it. I don't know if you can see it. I've got a, that looks like a joystick, but it's not. It's a fixed joystick. It's supposed to be better on my wrist, but my wrist hurt like a mother father right now. Anyway, S&P 500, right? Imploding, imploding, imploding. No, straight back up, up, trying to implode, trying to implode, trying to implode, straight up, straight up, straight up, straight up. Implode, up, down, up, up, down, 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 up, up, down. <laughs> So this is the frustrating kind of choppy market that we've been in. And this is why it's been hard to hold on to these shorts, even though they're ultimately going to drop like a rock, right? Well, ultimately, ultimately can be a long time, okay? A market's going to do what it's going to do, and it's sure it's going to frustrate the hell out of you in the process, right? So S&P 500, it sure looks like we want to come down here and test these old lows at the least. I keep an eye on, let's say, 4350 round numbers, which would be below this low. On the downside and 4600 on the upside, those aren't necessarily lead lines in the sand, but those are areas that I would keep an eye on. It's kind of Tarzan, good Tarzan, bad areas, right? You have to have a framework to kind of work around, okay? You have to have the rut row number, okay? And we're almost there in the NASDAQ. Let's say 3,600, just eyeballing it in the NASDAQ. And you can see this little crossing here. It's something that you can kind of play with, but you know, eyeball a market too, you know? So you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, I want to get long this thing because it's just chopping back and forth. You might want to wait for some additional confirmation, okay? But it can help to keep you on the right side of the market. But again, keep it even more simpler. Look at the Landry lights at the downside, but the 13 or the 30 EMA or whatever you want to use. But it's something to play around with a little bit here and there. Russell 2000 selling off a little bit. Longer term downtrend remains intact. So far, just kind of pulling back. Energy is about the only good looking area out there. Let's see if we can get rid of these things. 
let's add in a 30 EMA. I know you want to party with me, right? <laughs> I forget that I say that all the time. And, and last week or a couple of weeks ago, somebody's like, I want to party with you, big day. I'm like, all right. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. You just, you're talking about my joke. I love this nerd. I love this stuff. It's, it's just, it's awesome. Anyway, you can see energy's nice Landry light all the way up. Look at that. They hadn't touched the 30. I feel like tiny up. Look at the trend. It's huge. They have not touched the 30. For those keeping score, 230 EMA trading system right there. Your entry would have been here. Now, before you get all blown away, like, wow, Dave, that's amazing. Well, everything works better with trend, okay? And there's probably, nope, there's no signals in here. Let's see if there's a signal that was a fake out. Not really. So that's kind of cool about, sometimes that could work pretty cool. This was one back here, but it's cool. It hadn't kissed that 30 in a long, long, long time. What's uh, lower highs? Uh, the indices? Yeah. I need to mount that camera separately. Conglomerates banging out new lows, a little bit of vigor. I noticed that earlier tonight doing my analysis. Banks actually were making new highs when they stalled out and came back in. So they're kind of all over the place. I wouldn't rush out and buy the banks right now. Financials have begun to turn back down, as you can see. Kind of a choppy ride, though, right? Drugs. Not looking so hot in here, kind of rolling back over. But, yeah, a choppy ride there, too. Biotech, a little bit cleaner, okay? Had a little bit of a kind of an ABC up, and then now it's rolled right back over. Looks like it's a challenge its old lows. Health services selling off. If you guys want to ask about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. Retail's rolled back over. I mean, but again, you know, okay, down, down, no, up, up, down, up, down, up, 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 down, up, 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 down, you know, up, flat, down. So it's just kind of all over the place, no matter where you look. But for the most part, for now, check back often. It's to the downside. Like I said last week. It just seemed like a lot of headlines came out. And maybe I'm a little cognizant of all the headlines since I'm on stockcharts.com and I'm looking at my own stuff and YouTube is recommending tons and tons and tons of gurus to me because I, I do watch some of that stuff. But it just seemed like the number of upside headlines was concerning. And to me, it just looked like the market was retracing. Software, look at that, banging out new lows or nearly new lows with a little bit of vigor. Semiconductors all over the place, but what's the dominant trend? At least for now, intermediate term looks looks like they're headed lower. And uh, whatever the number is in the piece, 42, I forget the number, the exact number, maybe 42, it's about 4,300 is a TFM 10% system. And I could probably kind of eyeball that here. Let's see, where's 10%? Uh, probably right around there. So anything, yeah, if memory serves, anything on a close below 4,300, go in and watch last week's show for the number for the TFM 10%. All right, John, let's talk about Lou. Okay, Lou has been catching my eye as of late, okay? It doesn't have a tremendous amount of overhead supply, when something bottoms out, I kind of prefer it to like go down here and then make a long, 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 long saucer bottom and then come out of it, okay? But it certainly doesn't look too bad, okay? So yeah, on a little bit of a pullback, you're gonna have your bow tie set up on that one, John. And I agree with you, okay? You got a little overhead resistance to deal with, but not a tremendous amount. It's not a perfect setup, okay? But Perfect is going to be really hard to find, but if you really like something, you can kind of look past a few of those things, provided you're not really liking like 20 stocks right now. You shouldn't be liking 20 stocks. If you're liking 20 stocks, then, you, then you're trying too hard, okay? Like I told one of you guys, there was George, like I can't find a setup to save my life. And I could see George just banging my, you know, just trying so hard to find a setup. It's like, stop trying, it'll come to you, okay? All right, Paul, let's talk about Roast, Rust. What is that, Rust Stores? R-O-S-T. Yeah, looks like a dog, huh? <laughs> Holy crap. Now, is this coming off of, 
what I would still try to do at this level, okay, it's still pretty high levels, but like, remember that ADR we're talking about? See how high ADR is and how far it has to go, okay? I would still be looking for stocks at really high levels versus something like Ross, although Ross is, is you could argue that it's still at pretty high levels too, but try to find something that's just kind of in that second leg down right now so they have a ways to go. Okay, so what do you do? He sold a 120 put that expired tomorrow. Bird in the hand seems like it has some more downside. Earnings a few weeks. Sold the 120 puts. Holy crap, what'd you get for that? Every now and then I get tempted to sell some options and I tell myself, no. <laughs> you couldn't have gotten more than a buck for those, huh? Sold a 120 put? Oh, wait a minute. 120 put. Oh, shoot. That's uh, that's really deep in the money. Why would you sell a put so deep in the money? So you actually want this thing to go up? What's your what's your thinking on that? That seems a little dangerous because it seems like you'd want to trade with the trend. This thing's falling out of bed. If this thing drops 20 points tomorrow, you're gonna be in, in a hurt and pop. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> you bought the put. Okay, 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 okay. All right. You had me scared there for a second. Oh, congratulations. All right. You bought the put months ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and you know, here's the thing, like I said earlier, what you could do is uh, of course you already sold it. That's fine. But what you could do is you could have you could have maybe rolled it down to a put that expires tomorrow. You know, you sold the one, you bought a 120. Okay, you're 20, you're almost 20 points in the money. You know it could bounce tomorrow, two or three, four points against you, maybe even more, but you might be able to buy a 90 for like nothing, right? Even if it's a buck and you've got 20 something points in a trade, what's a buck, you know? Who cares? So yeah, um, think about rolling down when you have that much money on the table. And that might be, in that way you only have a little bit uh, up. Hey, Dave, what are your thoughts on shorting real estate stocks like EXR? You know, those real estate stocks are starting to trade more like momentum stocks. You got an HV of about 27, that's fine. You've got decent volume. And you know, Brad, I'm gonna, I might have to give you a high five on this. If I can find a little stupid thing. This really hurts my wrist. Can you guys do uh, carpal tunnel syn uh, syndrome surgeries and cubital tunnel? <laughs> I'll give you the service for life. <laughs> yeah, that looks great. I I can't make any I can't argue against that. You've got a nice downtrend here, pull back, and it's rolling back over. Yeah. Yeah, that ANGH, I tell you what, I got really tempted to buy that one intraday, but I saw it after it moved, okay? And I said, don't do it, okay? And and I almost said, maybe trade enough to lose. Well, let me just go in and risk a point, you know, and maybe just buy a couple hundred or whatever. And I said, don't do it, Dave. It's not worth it, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, so technically that would be like a buy at B, but uh, just too crazy. I mean, it's up, what, 160-something percent today. So that's just absolutely, even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous, right? So yeah, technically buy at B today, I was looking at it, I wonder why I was looking at it, you know, maybe, I wonder if it's a little bit lower. And I thought about it, I thought about getting it, but you know, sometimes you, I don't know if you guys had experience with this, but sometimes you see something going crazy like this and you're like, you know what? What the hell, I'm gonna buy a few hundred shares and maybe use a one point stop or something. And it pops up three or four points, you feel like a genius, and then they halt the mother father, right? <laughs> and you're like, Oh, it's halting. And then they unhalt it and it drops 10 points. And, you know, you went in thinking you, you risk a couple hundred bucks or whatever and maybe make a thousand or two or whatever. And then they halt the damn thing. And it seems like nowadays when they halt, you said it's halt the stock, you're like, oh, yes, yes. But nowadays they halt the stock and what happens? They open the damn thing five points lower. So I'm glad you asked about that. I'm glad I reminded myself of that because I I, I almost jumped in midstream on that, right? 
These said to keep going a bit, then crash. Yeah, they do. They do. And they're so damn dangerous. Once I once I get this far out of line, like the the BRCC when it was making its run, yeah, it wasn't up that much. Okay, it wasn't up enough to get it halted. Okay, but 100 and something percent. That's just too crazy. Maybe in and out fast tomorrow, but not for me. Yeah, I, I think I'd leave it alone. And you know, I have all the temptations that you have. I'm human. And you know, I want to jump into something like that, but I just got to remind myself that they still could halt it, and I still could get in a lot of trouble when it's up like 50% or something crazy. Now, this one here, it's making a little move. It, it's okay, maybe, you know, as long as you're just not betting the form. My day job keeps me out. Yeah, you know, busy traders make good traders. Um, you know, the, most of the money that I make is by being prudent and doing the right thing. And most of the money I lose is by doing stupid things, okay? I occasionally lose doing the right thing, but more often than not, I lose getting impulsive or doing something stupid. Uh, I call it, what's, what's it, Steve Ladd? Steve Ladd rode his motorcycle through the tunnel of flames and he got out the other side unscathed, turned around and went right back through it and he didn't come out the other side, you know? So I call it Steve Ladd in a trade or something like that. Or sometimes I'll make money on one side and then get cute and go the other way. But, you know, getting back to the psychology 24-7 was also some experience that comes in too, along with your emotions and everything else, managing those. And just knowing what the best setups are, when to trade, when not to trade. You know, that's the secret of trading, obviously. Take it the best, leave the rest. All right. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, bring it up in Facebook and we'll noodle with it there. If you're not in Facebook, why not? <laughs> DaveLeonard.com slash contact. Everybody have a great weekend and we'll talk again and likely no show next week. So I'll see you a week after. Thank you so much.